Assalamu alaikum dear students I hope you all are doing great today this is Dr Homera and I am currently working as assistant professor and serving as vice principal at Dow College of Biotechnology Dow University of Health Sciences In today's lecture I'll be discussing about gel electrophoresis which is a very simple rapid and sensitive analytical technique used for the separation of charged molecules particularly uh, biomolecules like proteins DNA and RNA In today's lecture, I will be discussing about principle and application of electrophoresis, followed by the different types of electrophoresis commonly used, in which polychromate gel electrophoresis, its types, and aqueous gel electrophoresis. And in the end, I will discuss briefly about isoelectric focusing and two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. So in the end of this article uh, of this uh, lecture you will be able to understand the principle of electrophoresis types of the uh, various electrophoresis and what information you can get by using those types of electrophoresis about your sample and you will also be able to have little bit information about the data interpretation and various other application of your uh, of this uh, technique So basically, if you uh, have any charged uh, molecule or charged particle and it, you suspend it between the two electrodes, those molecules will move towards the opposite electrode or you can say they are attracted towards the opposite electrodes. So electrophoresis is basically the migration and separation of charged particle under the influence of an elect external electric field. And the medium could be the solution-based medium or it could be uh, any uh, solid support or uh, supporting medium. In the case of gel, which is also called as the zone electrophoresis, the, uh, the migration or the separation of these charged molecules takes place on an inert supporting medium. What is the advantage of using the supporting media or gel for the separation of molecules compared to the free solution is that in the case of gel electrophoresis, you apply the sample into a narrow band, right? And then, the samples are separated into a discrete or small zones on those gel and it avoids the minimum mixing of the sample. Therefore, the separation and resolution of your uh, molecules uh, on those gel matrix or the supporting media is very good and it makes your analysis or interpretation easy. And at the same time, these uh, systems are low cost and easy to maintain. As I've already mentioned, uh, the separation of the charged uh, molecule under the influence of electric field is electrophoresis. And there are various factors that affect the electrophoretic mobility or mo migration of these molecules onto these uh, supporting media. And uh, these, could, these properties could be related to sample, could be related to the electric field, the buffer and the supporting media that you are using. If we talk about the sample, there are various factors that can affect the electrophoretic mobility of sample in, in your electrophoresis uh, gel or the media. For example, if, uh, if you have a charge on the sample, if you increase the charge on the sample, definitely the electrophoretic mobility would be increased. That is, there is a direct relationship between both of them. But at the same time, if the size of the molecule or the sample is increased, the electrophoretic mobility would be decreased. So, for example, if you have two sample molecules, both have the same charge. For example, both have the plus two charge on them. And one of the molecule has a higher molecular weight or size and other has the smaller molecular weight and size. So although they both have the same charge and they should move at the same speed, but the smaller molecule will move faster because of its small size as compared to the larger molecule. Because of the larger molecular weight, it, it will move slower compared to the smaller molecular weight molecule. And at the same time, shape can also affect the electrophoretic mobility. For example, if it's a globular or compact molecule, its movement or migration would be faster compared to the fibrous or thread-like molecules. According to the uh, Ohm's law, the current is directly proportional to the voltage and is inversely proportional to the resistance. So therefore, if we increase the voltage and current in the, uh, of the electric field, the migration or the electrophoretic mobility of the molecule would be increased. However, as there is an inverse relationship between the 
uh, as there is a uh, inverse relationship between the resistance and the current so if the resistance is increased the mobility would be de decreased and also if the resistance is increased the heat is also generated and once the heat is generated too much heat also affect not only uh, the mobility of the molecule but it also affects the resolution of the uh, uh, discrete zones or the bands that you uh, observe on the jet buffer has also a very main role in the electrophoretic mobility of the molecule because buffer influences the overall charge on the molecule so if you change the ph of the buffer definitely the charge on the molecule is altered and therefore it will affect the electrophoretic mobility if we talk about the uh, ionic strength as the ionic strength of the buffer increases the proportion of current which is carried out by the buffer is increased and proportion of current which is carried by the sample would decrease as a result it would decrease in the rate of migration of the molecule and at the same time high ionic strength like uh, resistance also um, generate the heat and uh, it will affect the resolution of the separation if you look at the supporting media the adsorption is basically defined as the retention of sample molecule by the supporting medium so if there is adsorption caused by the supporting medium it will affect the or decrease the electrophoretic mobility it causes the tailing of the sample that is retarded movement of the sample and again it will affect the not only the migration but also the resolution of your separated molecule on the uh, gel electro uh, endosmosis is due to the presence of charge group on the surface of the supporting media which again affect the movement of the charge group that is your molecule on the supporting media uh, the gels uh, basically uh, the gels are basically uh, made up of a, uh, they have a sieve like structure therefore the molecules enter onto these uh, into these uh, pores and pass through these pores and separated into the gels uh, or, or on the gels so if there is a small pore size and there is a large pore size this will affect the mobility of the molecule because if there is small pore size the smaller molecules those who can enter those sieves they can move faster however those molecules that do not enter or they have a difficulty in entering into the molecule either they would not move or their movement is or their rate of migration on the supporting media would be slower so now comes the question that if your sample contains three molecules with a molecular uh, weight uh, as shown below and these molecules are for example protein in nature and you have three protein molecules in your in your sample of molecular weight 10 kilo dalton 25 kilo dalton and 75 kilo dalton so if i ask you to write the sequence of their migration in electrophoresis from slowest to the fastest so as i have previously uh, described that if the sample molecular size is increased its electrophoretic mobility is decreased so if we if i ask you to write the sequence from slowest to fastest it means that the molecule which has the highest molecular weight will move slowest so in this case the molecule with the 75 kilo dalton will move the slowest followed by the molecule of 25 kilo dalton and uh, the uh, the fastest moving molecule would be of 10 kilo dalton so your sequence uh, would be c b and at the end molecule a there are wide uh, applications of electrophoresis and it is mainly used for the separation of protein dna and rna and by using the electrophoresis you can determine the number of these molecules present in your sample that is how many types how many proteins or how many dna or how many uh, rna uh, uh, molecules are present there you can even have an estimate about their quantity because if the quantity is present if there higher quantity is present the uh, the intensity of the zone or band uh, that you observe on the gel or the supporting media would be higher and if the quantity is lower then uh, you you will see very small or the light bands so you can have an estimate about the quantity or the concentration of those molecules present in your sample you can even identify them if you couple uh, the electrophoresis with other method for example uh, you use uh, tripton gyration and mass spectrometry you can have the uh, ident you can not you can identify the molecule you can have the uh, uh, information about the purity of your sample that if you are uh, using you are trying to purify a protein uh, from a complex mixture 
you would know that how many other contaminant proteins are present there so you can have an estimate about the purity of your sample you can even uh, can get the information about the presence of any enzymatic activity in your protein sample or uh, you can uh, uh, definitely know about the or get the information about the uh, uh, molecular weight of your uh, molecule of interest so the Applications of electrophoresis includes diagnostic research labs and uh, you can uh, use them in various industries to get the information about your DNA, RNA and protein molecules. What are the general steps that are followed in electrophoresis? The first step is your sample preparation and at the same time you, are, you polymerize your gels. So you, you prepare your sample, you isolate it from the source and then uh, you prepare your sample, you dissolve in a specific buffer uh, uh, that is compatible with the electrophoresis. At the same time, you polymerize the gels. When the gels are polymerized, you cast them and you put them into a chamber or the reservoir and you add the buffer. And then you place or, or, or uh, load your sample onto these gels and you perform the electrophoresis and at the end, you analyze your gels. The gels that you are polymerizing, they can be uh, polymerize in many different ways. These gels could be polymerized in a, in a form of a tube that is a capillary tube. You can have the horizontal gels and you can polymerize the vertical gels. It depends upon the type of electrophoresis uh, you are using and the type of information that you need from that uh, uh, method that you are using. The first and the most commonly used type of the electrophoresis are the polyectylamide gel electrophoresis and agarose gel electrophoresis. So first I will discuss about polyectylamide gel electrophoresis and uh, its various types. So in polyectylamide gel electrophoresis, uh, the gels are formed by the polymerization of acrylamide monomers and uh, a cross-linker is present there which is called as the bisacrylamide. So acrylamide monomer polymerize in the presence of a cross-linker bisacrylamide to form polyacrylamide gels as the name suggests that is PAGE, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And the concentration of acrylamide and the ratio of this cross-linker that is the bisacrylamide determine the pore size or the sieving, sieve size of these gels. So if you increase the concentration of acrylamide and the cross-linker, then the, the pore size would be decreased. And if you you see lower percentage or concentration of acrylamide, the pore size would be increased. So there's an inverse relationship between the concentration and the pore size. The concentration of monomer and cross-linker increase, the pore size would decrease. And in the case of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, we usually uh, run gels from 5 to 25 percent uh, gels are used and each uh, depending on the uh, sample molecular uh, weight that you want to separate. So each percentage has a fractionation range or the separation rate um, of the molecular weight of protein. So seeing that uh, in your sample or if you have a brief idea that what percent, uh, what sizes of the proteins or molecules are in your sample, you decide the percentage of gel on that basis. But if you have, if you don't know or you don't have the information about that, in that case you can use the lower percentage gel so that all of the molecules ranging from a small to larger molecule, molecular weight protein molecules in the sample get separated there. And once you have an idea from those gels that what is the range of molecular weight of proteins in your sample, then you can use further higher percentage uh, gels to have a good separation. Uh, for the proteins, the molecular weight uh, range of the proteins that can be separated on these gels ranges from 5 to 200 kilodaltons and in the case of polynucleotide, it's from uh, 5 to 3000 base pair in size. Now, how this polymerization takes place? Because uh, this polymerization takes place in the presence of two catalysts, that is TIMID, and which is uh, which stands for N N N N tetramethyl ethylene uh, diamine and ammonium sulfate, which we, which we call as uh, APS. So basically, what happens is that TIMID uh, actually generates the oxygen radicals uh, which react with the uh, uh, from the um, uh, generate the oxygen radicals from the ammonium persulfate and these oxygen radicals that interacts with the vinyl groups which are present in the acrylamide and this acrylamide to activate them and th in this way it causes the polymerization reaction 
and uh, this uh, solution is converted into a gel form. This is the uh, instrument which is commonly used for the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis and here you can see we have a gel casting uh, stand and, uh, and uh, there is the gel, gel casting module in which you put the two plates uh, that is the glass plates and then you uh, seal them from the bottom and then you prepare the uh, whole gel mixture in a solution form and you pour the gel in between these two plates uh, uh, and once the gel is polymerized then you take out the gel from here and then you put it into the running module and then running module is placed into the electrophoretic tank and then you connect it to the power supply you uh, load your sample and you perform you provide the electric current and you perform the electrophoresis now uh, the thickness of the gel basically depends upon these plates because there's a two types of plates over there one is the large plate and other is the spacer plate the spacer plate has a certain thickness that is ranges from 0 0.5 uh, 0.75 mm to 1.5 mm thickness so the type of the spacer plate uh, you use on based on that uh, the uh, the uh, your gel will polymerize into that thickness and when when you pour the uh, solution of the gel to polymerize at the same time you pu pu put these combs on top of these gels so basically the combs uh, where the uh, where the teeth of the combs are present at those places there will be no gel while the other places the gel is there so once the gel is polymerized and you remove these combs they actually generate the valve and these are the wells where you load your sample and then after loading you connect it with the power supply and you perform the electrophoresis so now your sample is basically uh, colorless right and so how would you know that you are loading and the gel is also colorless so uh, our tra transparent so how would you know that your sample is loaded into the wells for that, basically, we use a tracking dye, which is called as the bromophenol blue, which is of blue color. So basically, this tracking dye is added into the sample diluting buffer. And when you mix your sample into that sample diluting buffer, your sample actually turned, uh, your whole solution is actually turned into a blue color. So when you uh, add your sample into the wells, you can easily see the samples because of the presence of that tracking dye, that is bromophenol blue. And when you are doing the electrophoresis, uh, Again, uh, this tracking uh, die helps you to see uh, the, the extent of the electrophoresis performed, that is wh when the samples which are entered from the top of the gel, whether they are reached to the bottom of the gel or not. Once your tracking die reached to the bottom of the gel, it means that your whole electrophoresis procedure is complete and now you can turn off uh, the electrophoresis instrument and you can take out the gel. In the case of proteins, uh, you take out the gel and you put the gel in the uh, in a staining solution which is called as the Kumasi Brilliant Blue. Kumasi Brilliant Blue is again a blue colored dye which interacts electrostatically and non-covalently with the amino and carboxyl groups of protein. So where the proteins are separated into the gel, the Kumasi Brilliant Blue bind to those proteins and you will see uh, the blue colored band. Uh, on, on the gel which shows the number of the proteins that are present and separated in your, uh, uh, from your sample onto the gel. Uh, well, in the case of uh, this polyacrylamide gel, basically we use discontinuous buffer system. So now what is a discontinuous buffer system? It is basically uh, is that, uh, that uh, in the polymerization of gel, you basically use two types of gel. One is the resolving gel, which basically constitute the major portion of the gel. And on top of the resolving gel, when it's polymerized, we polymerize another gel, which is called as the stacking gel. Uh, what is the difference between the poly, uh, resolving gel and stacking gel? Usually, stacking gel is of 4 to 5 percentage, while the uh, resolving gel, which is major gel in which your separation basically takes place, is, has the higher proportion and its percentage range from 6 to 25 percent. Now, what is the purpose of doing uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, polymerizing two different types of gel? At the same time, I would like to mention here that the stacking gel has a pH of 6.8, while the resolving gel has a pH of 8.8. .8. So, using two different gels of two different percentages and two different pH, why we need it there? The reason is that we need to stack the sample. As the name suggests, the stacking gel. The purpose of the stacking gel is that so, uh, 
so that the protein samples are stacked and uh, on on top of each other and they enter into the resolving gel at the same time i would give an example of a like a marathon race so when uh, you have a marathon race all the uh, uh, participants uh, uh, that are participating in that race they uh, are standing at the same line and when when uh, you say them to run they start running at the same time and and then you will see that those uh, people or the those participant that are uh, that are running faster they reach to the end quickly as compared to the uh, uh, participants who are running uh, Uh, slower uh, they reach to the end later so the purpose of stacking gel is same for the proteins that is they stack the proteins on at the edge of the resolving gel so that once the proteins are entered into the resolving gel they all enter together and each of the protein get equal chance to get separated and now they are separated on the basis of their electrophoretic mobility and the factors which affect the electrophoretic mobility uh, of those molecules so this is the reason that we use a lower percentage gel in stacking gels so that each molecule small or larger could uh, uh, stack and in the uh, while in the case of resolving gel we do use different percentage because there we need the separation now what is the use of different uh, purpose of using two different ph so basically there are two ions that are responsible for this stacking uh, of uh, of the protein molecules onto the gel and these are called as the leading ions and trailing ions so what the leading ion is is the chloride ion over there and tra uh, trailing ion is the glycine ion so basically at ph 6.8 of the stacking gel the chloride ion has a negative charge while the glycine has a positive charge and the proteins are negatively charged over there because of the uh, uh, use of the uh, sds or even if they are not negatively charged they are uh, have a positive and negative charge mix mix and in the case of if we look at the electrophoretic gel at the bottom we have a positive charge that is the anode and at the top we have negative charge so at ph 6.8 the chlorides are negatives so they are uh, in, and they are the smallest so they, so they are the leading ones followed by the protein and then the glycine because it is positively charged it will try to retain towards the cathode so therefore the glycine and chloride ion Uh, sandwich the proteins between them and stack them onto the stacking gel once the proteins are uh, uh, once they reach towards the resolving gel the chloride ion again is negatively charged and the glycine because of the presence of ph 8.8 it also converted into a negative charge so therefore they both now uh, moving forward while chloride is a smaller molecular weight so it moving faster followed by the glycine and now they move forward and they quickly uh, eluted out from the gel because their purpose is to stack that was already completed and now the proteins enter into the resolving gel and separated on the basis of their intrinsic charge or their molecular weight so polyacrylamide gels basically divided into three main types that is the sds page or denaturing page native page which is also called as the non denaturing page and we can also use zymographics so in uh, sds page uh, uh, the uh, what uh, happening is that we are using a non ionic detergent which is called as the sodium dodecyl sulfate so in the polymerization of the polyacrylamide gels as well as in our sample diluting buffer we are adding an anionic detergent that is the sodium dodecyl sulfate but the purpose of sds page is that it denatures the proteins and it masks the intrinsic charge of the protein with the negative charge so as a result all the protein molecules that are present in the sample now they have a net negative charge and when you do the separation in the polyacrylamide gels what happens is that the proteins which has a smaller molecular weight will move faster followed by the proteins which have a uh, larger molecular weight because now the separation is taking place on the basis of their a uh, molecular weight and the intrinsic charge is masked with the anionic detergent that is the sds even uh, if you if a protein uh, has a disulfide bond so in order to do the complete denaturation we need to reduce these disulfide bond and for that purpose we use a reducing agent that is called as the beta mercaptoethanol beta mercaptoethanol uh, breaks the disulfide of the uh, bonds of the protein so that they becomes completely denatured in the presence of sds mass with negatively char negative charge and then separated on the basis of their molecular weight 
So as shown in gel over here, the proteins which have a lower molecular weight, they move faster as compared to the proteins which have a higher molecular weight, they move slower. So this is how a typical SDS phase gel looks like. That is your sample protein molecules are separated in different lanes like this. And how would you know about the molecular weight of those proteins? By comparing it with the molecular weight ladder. What is the molecular weight ladder? It is made up of the different mixture of proteins whose molecular weights are known. And when you run them along with your, uh, uh, in a well in your gel, uh, they are separated according to their molecular weight starting from the lowest molecular weight at the bottom and the highest molecular weight at the top and then you can compare the different uh, protein bands in your sample and by comparing with the standard uh, you can uh, identify or determine the molecular weight of your protein for example if you look at this protein in your sample its molecular weight is 72 kilodalton because it's very it's adjacent to the uh, molecular weight uh, uh, of protein who's, uh, uh, of the letter which has a molecular weight of 72 Kilodalton. So in this way, you can identify uh, the molecular weight of different proteins that are present in your sample. So now the question is that what is the molecular weight of the protein which is uh, shown in lane number 2. So we, uh, as I have already mentioned in the previous slide, by comparing uh, it, your, uh, your sample protein uh, with, uh, with the ladder, you can determine the molecular weight protein of your sample. So in this case, uh, the protein band is present between uh, uh, the molecular weight of, uh, of the ladder that is 31 kilodalton and 45 kilodalton. So in this case, the average of the molecular weight of these proteins would be the molecular weight of your protein that is present in lane number 2. For this purpose, what you would do is that you would add 31 plus 45 that which would be equal to 76 kilodalton. And then you divide it with the 2, the answer comes as 38. So the molecular weight of the protein which is present in lane 2 is actually 38 kilodalton. However, in, a, in order to get the exact molecular weight of that protein, you need to perform a mass spectrometry which gives you the exact molecular weight information about your protein. <clears throat> the other type of uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is called as the native page or the non-denaturing page. Compared to the SDS page, in native page, we do not use any non-ionic detergent, that is the SDS. Therefore, uh, in this case, the protein samples are run under non-denaturing and native conditions. And the separation here, rather than on the basis of uh, molecular weight, as we have seen in, in SDS page, here the separation of your protein based upon the intrinsic charge, size, and shape of the molecule. The advantage of using the native page is that uh, the proteins remain in their native conformation, that is their 3D natural conformation. And therefore, the activity of those proteins remains unaffected. As shown over here, that if, <clears throat> if you have a, a gel, as shown here, and uh, there are two proteins which are small in size, one has the high charge and one has the low charge. So therefore, the protein which has a, a low charge, it will move slower as compared to the protein which, which is of the same size but has high charge because here the separation is based on the in, uh, intrinsic charge of the protein. Another type of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is called as the zymography. And what is zymography? It is a, a technique which is used for the detection of hydrolytic enzyme activity on the basis of their substrate degradation in polyacrylamide gel. And for that, what we do is when we polymerize the polyacrylamide gel, we polymerize them in the presence of the substrate to that protein of interest. For example, if we are trying to see that our sample contains any proteases, so the protease, for the protease, the substrate would be gelatin or casein. So when we polymerize our acrylamide gels, we incorporate a small percentage like 1 to 2 percent of the substrate uh, into that gel and we co-polymerize the gel in the presence of the substrate. And then uh, we run the uh, electrophoresis in the same way and we are expecting that in our, our sample the enzyme is present. So once the electrophoresis is complete, 
we place the gel in the activation buffer that is the buffer which is required by the enzyme to do its enzymatic activity so if this your sample has enzyme present what the protease for example is the protease what it will do is that it will uh, degrade the gelatin and then when after this degradation is complete overnight then we stain the gel so after running the electrophoresis and staining there is an additional step in between that is the activation step that is you are placing your gel in the activation buffer so that enzyme could do its enzymatic activity so when you uh, stain the gels with the comasi blue after the uh, staining with the uh, after the um, uh, after the activation step we know that the comasi binds to protein electrostatically and non covalent and as in the case of zymography when we polymerize the gel we polymerized copolymerize it with the gelatin which is or the casein which is protein so as a result your whole gel will turn blue because all whole the gel contains the protein however if your sample contains any protease it uh, there at that position the sample would degrade the gelatin or casein and therefore at those position there will be no binding of the comasi dye and as a result you will see clear zones so these clear zone indicates that here in your sample these proteins contains the uh, uh, protease enzyme so in the, this way zymography could be used to give you the information about the presence of any enzymatic activity in your sample if uh, if you are trying to uh, see the activity of amylase in your sample you can uh, use the same procedure and in that case rather than uh, copolymerizing the gel with the uh, uh, with the gelatin or casein you can copolymerize the gel with the starch in the case of phospholipases uh, we usually use the gel overlay method in that case what we do is we simply perform the electrophoresis we do not copolymerize any substrate and once the electrophoresis is complete we place the gel in the activation buffer and then overlay the gel on the egg yolk agar plate so when uh, on the egg yolk agar plate we know that uh, the uh, phospholipases degrade the egg yolk uh, phospholipases so if your uh, sample contains any phospholipase activity on those region uh, on the uh, on the agar uh, egg yolk agar gel you will see a clear zone and that indicates the presence of a phospholipase enzyme in the case of lacases uh, we can use goicol and abts uh, which are which is the synthetic substrate to see the enzymatic activity in the gel so zymography is also one of the very useful polyacrylamide gel method which could be used to, uh, uh, to see the uh, presence of any hydrolytic enzyme activity uh, in your sample these polyacrylamide gels as i have previously mentioned that uh, it is made up of stacking gel and dissolving gel and in the case of resolving gel we only use a single percentage gel for example it could be 8% gel it could be 15% gel or it could be 12% gel depending on the uh, the sample uh, 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 that you are analyzing and the range of the molecular weight of proteins that are present there so in what happens in gradient gel gel that rather than using a single percentage resolving gel we polymerize the gels in a gradient of uh, increasing to decreasing percentage that is starting from the highest percentage gel at the bottom to the lowest percentage gel at the top and once that uh, gradient gel is polymerized gradient you can say gradient dissolving gel is polymerized then you can pour the stacking gel which is again of 4 or 5% and uh, what is the advantage of these gradient gel that uh, uh, the resolution is sometimes higher it's as it's shown here a same sample is analyzed by using 50% uh, sds page gel and 4 to 12% gradient sds gel and you see that in the case of gradient gel the separation is also good and the resolution of the band is also good so sometimes gradient gels could be uh, useful to increase the resolution and separation of your protein sample now the question arises that how you polymerize these gradient gels so for the polymerization of the gradient gels we use uh, we require a peristaltic pump and we use, we need a gradient maker or you can say gradient mixer so what a gradient mixer do it is made up of two chambers that is a chamber a and chamber b this chamber a is placed on the top of a magnetic stirrer and we put a small magnetic bead inside it these two chambers are actually connected to each other through a knob so initially when we are preparing the solution we close this knob so that the solution in both the chambers uh, would not uh, mix with each other 
in the chamber a we put the highest percentage of the gel for example in this case we will put the 12 percent gel solution over here and in the case of chamber uh, sorry uh, in the case of uh, yes and in the case of uh, chamber b uh, will place the lowest percentage gel as, uh, uh, in this case a 4 percent gel over here and then we'll connect an outlet tubing and place it into the plates uh, two glass plates in which we are polymerizing uh, the gel and now with the help of the peristaltic pump we start uh, taking the um, highest percentage gel solution from chamber a and start pouring into in between these plates so as a result at the bottom we have the highest percentage gel once a small level of uh, solution uh, or the unpolymerized gel solution entered into the gel we open the knob here and we turn on the magnetic stir now the lowest percentage gel start get mixing with the highest percentage gel and as a result the, the percentage over the uh, in chamber a start decreasing that is now it, it will not remain 12% uh, but now it, it may be turned into 11.9% then 11.8% and as soon as this uh, solution from chamber B mixing into the A the percentage of the gel is uh, uh, decrease over here and that it's continuously being poured with the help of peristaltic pump uh, into the gel plates so as a result a gradient of the uh, gel percentage is made and once this uh, whole of the mixture is uh, poured between the plates, the gel will allow to polymerize for 30 to 45 minutes as in the case of normal um, uh, electrophoresis. And once the gels are, uh, gel, gel, gradient gel is polymerized, we pour the stacking gel in the same way. We uh, prepare the sample, we load the sample, run the gel and stain it with the Komasi stain. But again, as I've mentioned before, that uh, by using the gradient gel, sometimes we get a better separation and higher resolution as compared to the single percentage gel. The other type of electrophoresis is called as the agarose gel electrophoresis. Now the agarose gel basically made up of agarose which is a purified uncharged polysaccharide derived from seaweed extract. And it is made up of repeating units of agar bios comprising alternating units of 3,6 and hydroelectone, lactose and galactose. So what happens is when we take this agarose and we dissolve it into the buffer and boil, as a result, uh, when we boil the solution, uh, the agarose will dissolve. And when after this boiling, we lower down the temperature of this solution. So at 40 degrees centigrade, as soon as the, this mixture reaches to 40 degrees centigrade, then the gel starts to gelate. And it will gelate into and form the same uh, sieving effect as we have seen in the polyacrylamide gel. Right? So in this way, uh, we can use different percentage of agarose gels, usually from 1 to 3 percent, and use for the separation of uh, molecules uh, of, of the larger molecular weight. For the analysis of the uh, DNA and RNA, what we have to do is we have to add an intercalating dye, that is the ethidium bromide, into the gels when, when we are cooling down this solution. And when we pour the gel, the gel is polymerized with the ethidium gel, and we run the our DNA and RNA sample onto these gels. The ethidium bromide is an intercalating dye. It intercalates between the DNA and RNA. So where the, there's the DNA or RNA separated into a discrete zone onto the gel, we, when we place this gel onto the UV light, we observe fluorescent bands of the DNA or RNA molecule. The typical instrumentation of agarose gel electrophoresis is shown here it's usually a horizontal gel so we have a gel casting tray we dissolve the agarose boil it allow it to uh, uh, cool uh, a little bit cool down then we add the ethidium bromide we pour the solution into this casting tray and then we pour, put the comb and allow the gel to polymerize once the gel is polymerized we'll uh, place the or load the sample uh, onto into the wells uh, using the same tracking dye that is the bromophenol blue we perform the electrophoresis and once the electrophoresis is performed, we observe the gel uh, in the UV light to see the present, uh, the fluorescence band of DNA or RNA. The another useful type of uh, electrophoresis is called as the isoelectric focusing. And what isoelectric focusing do, it separates the proteins on the basis of their isoelectric points. 
we know that the isoelectric point is a ph at which the net charge on the protein is zero so if i say that the protein has a p uh, has an isoelectric point of 6 it means that when we place the solution at at ph uh, that protein into a solution of ph 6 the net charge on that protein becomes zero if i take that uh, protein and bring it to the ph below its isoelectric point for example ph 4 or 3 then the net charge on the uh, on that protein molecules is positive and it moves towards the cathode and if i take that protein and put into a ph solution having the ph which is above the pi for example 8 or 9 then the net charge on that protein molecules would be negative and it would move towards the anode so how we do this isoelectric focusing because basically it's done on ipg strips that is immobilized ph gradient strips which are made up of polyacrylamide or agarose gel and they contains a mixture of amphoteric electrolytes which provides a ph gradient and these ipg strips are of various gradients are available they are ready made you just take the strip you soak your protein your sample onto these ipg strips and you perform the isoelectric focusing so we have uh, narrow and broad range ipg strips available the narrow range include ph 5 to 7 and 6 to 8 however the broad range ph strips include 3 to 10 ph strips and these strips can be of varying sizes for example 7 cm 11 cm and 14 cm so how you fix and do the fixing in a staining of gels uh, 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 in the ipg strip after performing the uh, isoelectric focusing you so uh, you soak these ipg strips into 10% tsa for removal of ampholytes and then you stain the gel again using the kumasi blue for tan and then you discard the staining solution and then place the gels in these staining solution so that the background or non specific kumasi blue uh, that is bind to the gel is removed and then you can see uh, uh, the uh, the protein separated on the basis of their isoelectric point at their respective uh, pi there is an another type of electrophoresis which is called as the two dimensional electrophoresis it's the name suggests that electrophoresis is performed in two dimensions and it actually uses two different types of electrophoresis that are combined with each other the number one is the isoelectric focusing that is in the first dimension uh, you separate the protein uh, using the isoelectric uh, focusing uh, in a horizontal direction and then once the proteins are separated there rather than staining them Uh, you directly take the ipg strip and put uh, place it onto a any second dimension uh, gel uh, which is a vertical gel and it could be sds usually it is sds page but you can use native page you can use gradient page you can use rhymography in the second direction so basically in two dimension that electrophoresis is performed in two dimension and using two different types of electrophoretic method what is the advantage of this electrophoresis it has a very enhanced resolution of complex protein mixture and it has a very wide application in the proteomics techniques in which uh, you separate complex mixture of protein in a single gel and the advantage is that because you are using two different characteristics for the separation of protein so if the two proteins which have a same pi they may be separate uh, they are present at the same position on ipg strip but when you put that ipg strip and put it into the second dimension in sds page so the two proteins that have the same pi may not have the same molecular weight so they are get separated here so in this way by combining two different electrophoretic methods you are actually increasing the resolution of the complex uh, and the separation of the complex mixture of proteins so it is a very powerful and widely used method for the analysis of complex protein mixtures it is used for the cell and tissue extract or other biological uh, biological sample uh, analysis and it is capable of simultaneously separating thousand of different proteins and it is uh, useful in clinical diagnostic for example when you want to compare a normal uh, sample with a disease sample and you want to see the over or low expression of any protein in a disease sample compared to the normal sample that could be used for uh, as the biomarker of that protein later on if you identify that or you can compare the uh, untreated and treated patient sample using uh, these methods so it will it would give you a very good comparison about the proteins that are uh, lower or highly expressed under the two different conditions
so in summary basically uh, i would conclude uh, uh, my this topic over here and in summary i would say electrophoresis is a useful technique that could be used for the analysis of biological molecule its various type provide useful information related to the molecular weight composition purity and enzymatic activity of your sample with this i would like uh, to thank you all for your attention i hope this uh, lecture would uh, be a very useful one for you uh, thank you very much for your attention